This is the University of Utah's course on computer organization and my name is Rajiv Balasubramanian. In this first set of videos, uh, I'm going to motivate the need for understanding computer organization or computer architecture and I'm going to discuss a few important technology trends. So the first question I'm going to address is, you know, why do we need to study hardware, right? So as a computer science major, a large number of the courses that you take are either on algorithm design or software design or programming languages and so on. There are very few classes where you actually open the hood of your computer system and look at the underlying hardware. And, and why is that important? Why is it important to get your hands dirty in terms of understanding the underlying hardware, right? So here are three important reasons why you need to understand this. The first is that Moore's law is on a steady decline. So what is Moore's law? So Moore's law dictates that the number of transistors on a chip is going to double roughly 18 to 24 months. And this is a curve that we've been riding for the last many decades, right? So every two years, your performance roughly almost doubles. And what this means is that when you write a program, every two years, that program automatically doubles in, uh, in performance. And this is a curve that we can no longer write, right? So we're kind of nearing the end of Moore's law. And this is because of the limitations being imposed by physics. And as a result, you know, we are not going to see automatic um, impressive improvements in system performance every few months or every year. So as a programmer, if you want your, your application's performance to improve every year, this is something that you may have to do by yourself. And you know, this does not mean that architectures will stop evolving, right? So hardware designers will continue to design new processes that have better architectures that provide higher performance. But very often that higher performance is going to depend on the application developer themselves, right? So for example, hardware designers may include accelerators on their, on their process. And it is up to the application developer to use these accelerators in a smart manner, right? So it's going to require more involvement from the programmer. And we're already seeing some of this, right? So one of the major, uh, major changes in architecture in the last few years is the introduction of multi-core process, right? So most high-performance processes that you buy today are going to have multiple processing cores on them. And it is up to the programmer to write an application that can be partitioned into multiple threads that can all run in parallel on these many cores on the processor, right? So we're already seeing uh, this, this emerging hardware where the improvement in performance is not automatic but requires some involvement from the programmer. So it's more important for the programmer to kind of understand what's happening under the hood and understand how the hardware actually behaves. We're all also seeing an emergence of new platforms, right? So when you create an application, that's an application that sometimes runs on a tablet, sometimes on an Android phone, sometimes on an Apple phone. It also may run on a cloud backend and you will see a variety of hardware within the cloud, right? So uh, a single application runs on a variety of different architectures and on, and on a variety of different systems. And you might see you know, varying performance levels or varying energy levels on each one of these systems. And so to reason about why your program behaves in a certain manner on each system, you need to understand the hardware a little bit more, right? So uh, knowledge of the hardware helps programmers or helps computer science majors reason about their code and write better code. The argument for why to study hardware is a little bit more obvious for someone that's doing a computer engineering major, where you're either building an embedded system or you're designing a chip or writing an operating system or a compiler. All of these uh, aspects are very closely tied to the hardware, right? So the operating system, you know, makes system calls and understands the resources on the hardware. The compiler is actually producing assembly instructions that are directly being uh, being understood by the underlying hardware. And of course, as a chip designer, you know, you can't begin unless you have some understanding of what the components on your chip are, right? So I think it's much, it's much easier to make the case to a computer engineering major that you absolutely need to study what a chip looks like and what the hardware looks like. So just as an example of what you will learn during the class and how that is useful, let me just go through this example that's mentioned in the textbook. And for the most part, these videos will follow the textbook written by Hennessy and Patterson, the computer organization hardware software interface textbook. So they provide an example of matrix vector multiplication. And if you write your program and run it on a naive piece of hardware, you'll get a certain level of performance. But then, you know, as you go through the chapters in the textbook and as you design a better processor, you will see the performance of that application improving uh, over time, right? So once you introduce data level parallelism techniques, 
you see a boost in performance by about 3.8x, right? And of course, we'll talk about what this is much later. The subsequent chapters will talk about loop unrolling, out of order execution, which is like which is a hardware technique to improve performance. That adds another 2.3x in terms of performance. And then we'll talk about the memory hierarchy and how a technique such as cache blocking can further improve performance by 2.5x. And then finally, we'll leverage multi-core processors and thread level parallelism to get a 14x improvement in performance, right? So as you go through the different chapters in the textbook, you'll be introduced to various innovations uh, that can provide a 200x boost in performance. And this is performance that you would not have unless you have a deep understanding of the hardware and know how to perhaps restructure your application to take advantage of these hardware features. All right, so hopefully I've motivated uh, this class and convinced you that this is an important class to take. Let me now shift gears and talk about important technology trends. So in this figure, what I'm showing you is performance over time. So we'll see that you know there's a stretch of almost 20 years in between over here where performance was increasing by about 52% every single year. And then in 2003, we saw that this curve started to flatten out, right? And so since then, we've only been seeing an improvement of about 22% every single year. Right, so what are the reasons behind this impressive improvement? And what is the reason behind the recent decline in this improvement? So firstly, you know, during the stretch, we were seeing the number of transistors doubling on the chip every 18 to 24 months following Moore's law. And what we see here is that performance kind of tracks the improvements you know, because of Moore's law. Right? So as we got more transistors, we found a way to put those transistors to good use. We also saw our transistors getting faster, and that led to faster clock speeds. If you don't quite understand what a clock is, this is something we'll cover uh, a few videos later. But uh, the bottom line is that you know because of architectural improvements, because of faster speeds, we ended up seeing this improvement of about 50% every single year. And then you know around 2003, there were a couple of things that happened. So the first one is that we hit the power wall. And the second thing is that most of the low-hanging fruit had been picked, right? Or, or what it means is that the easy ways to improve performance had already been uh, been employed, and any additional techniques that we could think of were all kind of power-hungry, and with the power wall upon us, it was hard to kind of incorporate those features, right? So to kind of understand this better, we need to understand the power wall a little bit better, right? So let's look at this next slide over here where I first provide an equation for dynamic power. Right? So dynamic power uh, is a function of the activity on the chip, that is the number of transistors that are switching on and off. It is a function of the capacitance of each of those transistors. It is also a function of the voltage that those transistors are operating at. And in fact, it's voltage square. And then finally, the frequency, that is, you know, in a second, how many times are those transistors switching on and off? So with Moore's law scaling, you know, as transistors became smaller, we had more transistors on a chip. As a result, the activity on the chip also increased. But the capacitance per transistor was also kind of decreasing, right? Because the transistors became smaller. We were also able to reduce the voltage that these transistors were operating at. So voltage was going down. And in addition, you know, since we were trying to get higher speeds, since we were trying to make our process run faster, we were also increasing the clock speeds and the frequency, right? So each transistor was switching more often in every single second, right? So the net effect of these various trends for the longest time meant that dynamic power kept increasing. And this is shown in this figure below, right? So uh, for several years, the dynamic power kept increasing and kept increasing quite dramatically. Once we got near the 100 watt limit, you know, there were a few things that we had to do, right? So once you're consuming 100 watts over a few millimeters square, uh, you start running into the heat problem or thermal emergencies. So when you're producing heat at that rate, that heat also has to be sucked away. Okay, otherwise the the temperature of the chip keeps on increasing and it eventually stops working correctly and it eventually melts. So the best way to take heat away from the processor is to add a heat sink to the processor, which is like a fin-like structure, and then you blow air across it using a fan. Right? So this is a fairly cheap solution and it works quite well if your process is consuming, say, 100 watts or you know, maybe even close to 150 watts. Okay? But if you want to increase the power on the chip beyond that, 
then you need to resort to more fancy techniques such as liquid cooling and that greatly increases the cost of your system so you know most architects most chip developers are trying to keep the power consumption of their chips at close to 150 watts or maybe even less than that so there was a need to get off of this curve where we are keeping on increasing the power consumption per chip a second reason was that voltage reductions became much harder so once we brought the voltage down to you know close to about 1 volt it was hard to reduce that voltage much more so this voltage reduction kind of starts to go away and when that happens you know to keep the dynamic power in check and not to exceed say 100 watts or 150 watts you have to also stop increasing frequency right so we kind of also stop this to make sure that we weren't exceeding these limits okay so in recent years what has happened is that voltage reductions have kind of gone down as a result frequency reductions have also kind of gone down so those two have kind of been stagnant and the level of activity and the capacitance has still continued this trend a little bit slower but it has continued this trend you know kind of keeping pace with Moore's law and those two effects roughly cancel each other out and so as a result you know dynamic power has been a little bit more constant off late and that's kind of what I'm showing you in this figure below so the two bottom line conclusions from the slide is one that power has to be constant and this is so that you can make do with relatively simple cooling techniques and the second point is that frequency has to now be stagnant because increasing frequency would kind of upset this equation and you know make you exceed that power limit okay so going back to this figure again over here you'll see that you know two different things have happened one is that the frequency has now become roughly constant and number two we have to be much more energy aware or power aware in our design right so a fancy technique to improve performance may not be viable if it increases power consumption too much right so we have to be more moderate with our architectural innovations right we can only do kind of simple things which don't increase power consumption too much okay and as a result instead of enjoying a 50 percent improvement every year we are now only enjoying a 20 percent improvement every year because the frequency improvements have gone away and because the architectural innovations are a little bit more modest